Hello everyone, it's been a while. I intended to have a video up ages ago. I started a big project and had to put it on pause so that video didn't happen. But now I'm back at it and making a box. This is a piece of spalted beach I've been saving for the right moment for a while. And uh, this whole design grew out of this piece of wood. A friend of mine is getting married and I decided to make them a small dovetail chest with this spalted beach book matched for the lid. So after re it once with the freshly filed ripsaw, I took the best half and re it again to about 8mm thick which was enough to plane to a 6mm finished thickness. Planing thin parts like this is easiest with double stick tape on my bench, since my tail vise system is not precise enough to hold on to it securely. I checked for wind, tweaked it accordingly and squared up the edges. While the panel was drying, I picked out this piece of curly maple for the front and back of the box. This is an interesting offcut. Should be some good small veneers in there. Might be the seed of some other idea further down the line, like the spalted beach was this time. And this is a thick piece, so I could resaw some more and get both front and back out of it. I feel like we don't talk enough about how much resawing there is in woodworking. Like, joinery is fun and all, but this is where the real hours are spent. Hard to argue with the results though. I flattened these boards entirely with a smoothing plane since I'm terrified of tearing out this wavy grain. And it kinda goes to show you really don't need several planes. And number four will flatten boards fine if that's what you have. For the sides of the box I chose walnut for maximum contrast in the dovetails later. I don't usually go for such super contrasting woods, but this time that accentuation was exactly what I wanted. By cutting out the middle of the piece I removed a section where the grain changed direction to make it easier to avoid tear out in later stages. Then I began the dovetailing by scribing base lines. The ends of the boards will not end up squares, so that's both why I referenced the edge of the board and why I didn't go for something more accurate than ruler and pencil to decide the exact location of the base lines. They do of course need to match up on the front and back pieces of the box, so I transferred them to the other board like so. I only scribe the insides at this stage as I don't want visible scribe lines on the outside at this time. I don't always take the time to create this step on the inside of the tails, but it is definitely worth it in my opinion, as this will give a really solid registration when marking the pins later. It doesn't need to be deep at all, this is like 1mm and a pretty fast cut. I decided to shape the ends now, since the dovetails need to be spaced so the gaps are consistent along a curve and that felt easiest to do if the curve is in place first. I like my dovetail pins super thin, just a saw curve wide at the point, and when they are that slim, inconsistencies are very noticeable. It still didn't end up perfect, but probably a little better than if I had laid out the tails before shaping the end. In the layout stage, it's important to know if you're planning to make the lid by sewing through one of the pins and separating it from, from the box that way. That was my plan, so I made that pin slightly wider than the rest. I also varied the tail size a bit, so the longer ones in the middle are also a bit wider than the shorter tails on the edges, so it looks more balanced. The joinery will be a focal point of this design, so I wanted to think it through a bit more than I do for primarily structural joints. This angle block usually references the end of a board, but it works just as well against the baseline when the end is not square. I sawed the tails two boards at a time, and since I only have the base lines on the insides, I clamped them outsides facing towards each other, so I can use the inside baseline on both the near and far side. Thank you. 
Then with the saw cuts made, I can scribe base lines on the outside precisely where they need to be and avoid having a line running across the tails. Nothing wrong with that, just not the look I wanted here and in this case I felt it was worth the extra effort. I chop the waist going down one third of the depth from the first side, then two thirds from the other which puts any torn or crushed fibers closer to the center than if you go halfway from both sides. I made the final decision on the orientation of the components and labeled the corners accordingly and then set up a marking gauge to the thickness of the tails and described base lines on the pin boards. After the base lines are in place I like to put some masking tape on the ends as it can be quite hard to see scribe lines in end grain otherwise. This is a dovetail alignment board, a super simple jig that does exactly what it sounds like, just a little alignment assistance. Not necessary by any means, but a neat thing if you cut a lot of dovetails, and David Baron shows it in more detail in his dovetailing videos. I clamp the pin board ever so slightly above the surface of the jig, so that rebate on the tailboard can just catch on it and give the perfect position. Then with the tailboard out of the jig I pencil some vertical guidelines to follow with the saw. With sockets this wide and shallow I find it faster to just chop them out rather than fret sawing. Also an opportunity to maintain that sharpening discipline. You don't want the edge to be dull when you get to the most important final cuts. and a dry fit. A bit tighter than ideal, but should work. Next up I need to make grooves for the lid and bottom, so I set up the marking gauge to the thickness of the panel, locked the bars together, and found the correct offset to end up with a groove centered in one of the tails. And this is a stopped groove since the ends of the tails will be visible on the finished box, so I couldn't use a grooving plane. Instead I approached it sort of like a long shallow mortise. On the side pieces however a grooving plane should have been possible but for some reason I didn't do that and just kept chopping with a chisel. I wish I could say I had a reason for this in the moment but if I did I can't remember what it was. Made some nice router plane curls at least and I use a finger as a fence here to keep it running straight and not dig into the walls. After that I could cut the lid panel to length, lining it up with one dovetail baseline and adding two groove depths of length to the other end. Why not line it up with uh, uh, stops of the stopped groove? Well, I made the grooves a smidge over length to make sure they are not too short and therefore a panel sized to the groove length would not fit in the assembled box. I decided to pre-finish the panel now, one coat at least, since it will shrink and could expose bare wood if I finished it after assembly. This is the only piece that will be finished on the inside, since it's a floating panel I want it to have equal moisture absorbing properties on both sides. Otherwise I like insides to be unfinished so you can smell the wood when you lift the lid, something I learned from Rob Cosman's drawer making videos. 
For the bottom of the box I went with plywood. A bit odd for what I'm going for here, but I had this sheet that's a relatively good match for the oak I intend to line the inside with. And I wanted the stability of plywood because of that lining I'll be putting in, since it will inevitably push some glue onto this panel and lock it in place, possibly causing cracking if I use the solid wood bottom. It's a narrow box, so you could probably get away with it, but I'm still not confident at estimating shrinkage rates, and I wanted to play it safe. Alright, with the box glued up, I planed flush the top edge and brought down the sides to be flush with the pins. This is not the final smoothing, but I still took super light cuts with a freshly sharpened blade. Then remember how one pin was slightly wider than the other? Time to cut it in half. I used the saw with the thinnest kerf in my possession to lose as little material as possible. Now I'll move on to the inside, which will be quarter sawn European oak, reclaimed from, from the drawers of an old broken dresser. There will be a lift out tray made from this material, and a half height lining glued to the inside of the box which the tray can sit on. Starting with the lining, I need to shoot miters on these and fit them precisely into the box. I just clamp and angle the block to my shooting board to do this and take it slowly and check the fit often. Gluing these in, I can put glue on the lining piece for the first one, but the rest have to slide into place and would leave glue on the inside walls above the lining, so for those I put the glue on the box walls. This puts the squeeze out on the bottom panel as I touched on earlier, hence the plywood there. I usually don't wipe off the squeeze out as that spreads it around and creates a bigger splotch where the finish won't soak in, but as I won't be finishing the inside it seemed easier to get rid of it now rather than chiseling it out when dry. And then it's time for the tray. Same process, fitting the oak to the interior, only shooting 90 degree ends instead. Then I scribed base lines for the dovetails. Here I don't really mind the lines being visible across the tails. It's on the inside of the box, so not such a focal point of the design, and it won't get finished, which makes such scribe lines stand out a lot more. Okay. 
Of course, if you don't want to make a dovetail alignment board, just describe some pins. The plane on its side trick and the block to line up the reference edges works fine too. That extra large half pin is in this case to allow the top of the pin boards to be shaped into an arch, so the pin will look proportional in the end. Speaking of which, I then marked where the curve should end, and the center, and connected the points with an arch. Chiseled, rough it out, and spoke shaves to refine. Do you need two flat bottom spoke shaves? No, and if you only want one, I'd suggest one with a tight mouth so you can smooth with it. Though, if you do a lot of curves, you might want a roughing spoke shave soon too. This time with a very thin stock it's easy to accidentally clamp it out a square, so I measured and compared the diagonals. Another way is to glue it inside the opening it will fit into, but then the squeeze out could lock it in place, so I didn't dare to do that. A quick bit of touch up on the joints and this is the fit at the moment, but it's hard to tell how the tray really fits without its bottom. So to add that I'm gonna need some small square stock to put a groove in, since the walls of the tray felt too thin for taking a groove. I love getting the 45 out, such an incredible piece of equipment. I also rounded over the corner that will end up inside the tray for a cleaner look. then fitting them into the tray exactly like how the lining was fitted to the box. Off camera I made another beach panel for the bottom and then I could glue it all up. With that drying, it is time to hinge the lid, first marking their positions, then measuring the thickness and scribing half the depth with a marking gauge. I made a bunch of saw cuts down to the depth and paired it out with a chisel. Then I marked for screws and drilled pilot holes. I lubricated the screws with wax, as is commonly done with brass screws, and put them in very slowly and carefully to not strip the head. Then I could hold the lid in place, scribe the positions of the hinges, and repeat the process.
I aligned the lid as well as I could because there is still a lot of wiggle room and marked the screws. And when these holes are drilled, the lid's position is final, so care must be taken in this step. With the lid attached, it was finally time to shape the outside, starting by sawing away the majority. I then roughed out the curve with a heavily set block plane and refined it with a smoother. Now the tray has dried and I checked that the bottom panel was still free to move, which it was. Then I planed the underside flush and smooth. It just needs some sort of pull now, something to grab so you can lift it out of the box. I decided to put a small block at either end shaped a bit to invite the fingers to pinch them. The top curve could be created quickly on the shooting board and smoothed with a file. For the longer concave curve I used the turning saw followed by gouge and then rasp, finished with card scraper. Then I cut this in half, smoothed the sides and glued the resulting two blocks into the tray. While that dried, I moved on to final smoothing of the box, starting with card scraping the sides. The front of them got a few last passes with the smoothing plane, bringing the lid into alignment. I had to get the scraper here as well to get rid of some stubborn remaining tear out. Then I could locate, draw and carve out a little spot to lift the lid with. A little bit of squeeze out removal in the tray and then I could test the fit. And with that it's time for finish. I went with Osmo Gloss to bring out the curly figure without turning it overly yellow. I brushed it on thin and wiped off the excess once the whole box was covered. I made sure to hit the edges that are exposed when opening the box, as that would look odd unfinished, but otherwise avoided the inside. Some balled up heavy brown paper is my favorite way to buff this finish. Then for the inside where the tray slides, I rubbed some candle wax. This has basically no smell and gives a very slippery surface. I also candle waxed the outside of the tray and I think it goes in a little bit smoother thanks to it. And there we have it. I do apologize for the long wait. As I touched on earlier, I began working on something else that should have been a video much sooner, but I lost motivation for it and I don't know if it'll get finished. 
Then when editing this I got a cold that wrecked my voice and when it was starting to come back I couldn't find my microphone because by then it had been so long since I made a video. At that point I just went out and bought a new one to get this done, much to the disappointment of the consumerism skeptic in me. But I took the opportunity to upgrade a little so maybe the audio is at least a touch crispier. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to get the next video out a little bit sooner. Bye.